Happy days in Torkering passed quickly. For some time we were still standing in Villas Octetres, where we received a new replenishment, and on November 15, 1917 went to Lecluz, the seat of the then reserve battalion of the position indicated to us. Lecluz turned out to be a rather large, lake-surrounded village in the province of Artois. There were ducks and coots in the extensive reed beds, and the reservoirs were teeming with fish. Although fishing was strictly forbidden, mysterious sounds were heard on the water at night. Once a local commandant's office handed me some books of soldiers from my company who had been caught in the act. They had been killing fish with hand grenades. I said nothing about it, as the good mood of the command was dearer to me than the security of the French hunt or the dinners of the local superiors. From that time on a huge pike, brought by an unknown hand, lay at my door every evening. The next day I gave a dinner for both my company officers, its chief dish being called Pike Anna Lohengrin. On November 19, with my platoon officers, I inspected the position we were to occupy in the following days. It was located near the village of vise en artois but we did not get into the trenches as soon as we thought. Every night we were raised on alert and kept on alert alternately at the position of Woten, artillery cut-off trench, and in the village of Durier. These experienced soldiers realised that this could not go on for long. Indeed, on November 29 we learned from our battalion commander, Captain Brixen, that we were to take part in a broadly conceived counter-attack of the arc-shaped bulge, which the tank battle at Cambrai had pressed into our front, although we rejoiced that we had finally changed from the role of Amville to that of Hammer. We still wondered whether the team, exhausted by the fighting in Flanders, would stand the test. I relied on the fighting spirit of my company and its iron backbone, experienced platoon leaders and excellent non-commissioned officers. So on the night of November 30 to December 1, we boarded trucks. The first casualties in my company were due to one soldier who dropped a hand grenade, which mysteriously exploded and severely wounded both himself and his comrade. The other tried to play up the madness to sneak away from the battle. After a long bagpipe, a severe kick in the ribs by a non-commissioned officer brought him to his senses again, and we finally moved off. We rode stuffed like herrings in a barrel, almost as far as Barol, and there, sitting in a ditch, waited a long time for orders. In spite of the cold, I lay down in the meadow and slept till dawn. It was with some disappointment that we learned that the 225th Regiment, under whose command we were, had refused our assistance in the assault. In the meantime, we were to lie low in the palace park of Barala, being on the alert. At nine o'clock, our artillery made furious fire strokes, which between 11. 45 I-11, 50 condensed to a hurricane fire. The Bolon Woods, thanks to strong fortifications not captured, but only blocked from a frontal position, disappeared under yellow-green clouds of gas. At 11. 50, we saw through binoculars how the lines of defence grew in the empty, crater-riddled field, while in the rear batteries rose up and moved to another position. A German pilot set fire to an English tethered balloon, and the observers jumped out of it with parachutes. The pilot circled a little more around the hoverers, firing tracer bullets at them, a sign that the war was becoming increasingly ruthless. After enjoying the spectacle of the aerial combat, which we watched from the heights of the palace park, we emptied a whole pot of noodles, lay down, in spite of the cold, directly on the ground for an afternoon nap, and at three o'clock received orders to advance to the regimental position hidden in the lock of a dried-up canal. We made this way platoon by platoon, showered with a faint scattered fire. From there, the 7th and 8th companies were sent to the combat training commander to replace the two companies of the 225th. 500 metres, which had to be overcome, along the bottom of the canal, accompanied by dense barrage fire, without losses, squeezed into a single tight lump. We ran to the target. Hordes of corpses told that not one company had paid here with its blood. Reinforcements were huddled against the embankments and were busy making holes for shelter in the crumbling masonry of the walls with feverish haste. As all the places were occupied, and the terrain itself, as a landmark attracted fire, I took the company to the field on the right and left each man to make his own arrangements in the craters there. A piece of shrapnel rattled and jabbed into my bayonet. Together with Tebby, who with his eighth followed our example, I found a suitable crater, and we immediately pulled it over with a cloak tent. We lit a candle, ate supper, smoked our pipes, and shivering with cold, talked a little. Tebby, who even in the midst of this wildness continued to be a dandy, told me a long story about a girl who had posed for him in Rome. At eleven o'clock I received orders to advance to the former front line and report to the troop commander, 
to whom the seventh company was subordinate. I ordered everyone to assemble and led the men forward. Only single, powerful shells were still falling. One of them, like a satanic greeting, slapped in front of us, filling the bed of the canal with dark smoke. The team fell silent, as if an icy fist had struck them on the back of the head, and hurried after me with uneven steps, climbing over barbed wire and piles of stones. It is impossible to describe the uneasy feeling that creeps into the soul when crossing an unfamiliar position at night, even if not under heavy fire, being soldiers' sight and hearing succumb to the strangest deception. Between the formidable walls of the trench he feels lonely like a child lost in a dark desert. Everything seems alien and cold, as in an enchanted world. At last we found a place where the front line ran narrowly into the canal and, squeezing through the crowded trenches, made our way to the battalion fighting post. I entered and saw a group of officers and liaison men in such a stuffiness that the air could have been cut in slices. I was informed that the attack at this place had accomplished little or nothing, and that a further advance was contemplated for the next morning. The prevailing mood here did not bode well. Two of the battalion commanders were having an altercation with their adjutants. From time to time the officers of the special forces threw a remark or two from the height of their bunks, stuffed like baskets of chickens, and joined in the general conversation. The cigar smoke made it hard to breathe. The soldiers were trying to cut bread for their masters in the crush. A wounded man who ran in, reporting an enemy grenade attack, raised the temporary alarm. At last I was able to write down the assault order concerning me. I and my company were to attack Drakenweg at 6 a.m., and from there break as deeply as possible into the Sieg-Fried line. Both battalions of the position regiment were to attack the flank on the right at 7 o'clock. This difference in time immediately aroused in me the suspicion that he who gave the orders did not really believe in the goodness of the roast and determined for us the role of guinea pigs. I was against the bifurcated attack and ensured that we did not move out until 7 o'clock. The coming morning showed how important this change had been. A company torn out of its connection by a foreign command is not spoiled. As I knew the location of Druckenweg only approximately, I asked for a map at parting, but as it turned out it was not issued. I resigned myself to fate and went out. For quite some time I wandered about the position with my heavily equipped men, until a soldier at a small trench branching forward, blocked by Spanish horsemen, discovered a sign with a half-erased inscription Druckenweg. As I stepped into it, I heard indistinct foreign speech within a few paces. I had not expected to find the enemy so near, almost on my own line, with no precautions whatsoever, and immediately blocked the trench with a squad. At Drachenweg itself was a huge hole, apparently an anti-tank trap. In it I assembled the whole company to explain the battle mission and assign platoons to the assault. My speech was interrupted several times by light shells, an unexploded shell even flew into the rear wall. I stood at the top at the very edge, and at each hit I saw the moonlit steel helmets bending low and rhythmically beneath me. Fearing a stray shell, I sent the first and second platoons back to the position, and with the third platoon settled down in the hole. Parts of the unit, the day before defeated at Druckenweg, had frightened my men, and they told me that fifty metres away the trench was obstructed by an English machine gun that could not be bypassed. In response to this, my platoon commanders and I agreed that at the first repulse from the right and left, we would rush to the slab and beam hand grenades. The interminably long hours of waiting I spent in the hole, huddled closely to Lieutenant Hopf. At B o'clock I rose and with that peculiar mood which precedes any assault, gave the last orders. There is a feeling of some strange sluggishness in the stomach. You talk to the squad leaders, joking, running back and forth, as on parade in front of the commander-in-chief. In short, looking all the time for something to do to escape from the thought drilling you. Someone offered me a mug of coffee, diluted with strong alcohol, as if by magic it injected life and confidence into me. At precisely seven o'clock we set off in a long line in a certain sequence. The Drakenweg was unoccupied. A row of empty drums behind the barricade indicated that the machine gun had been removed. This inflamed our fighting spirit. We entered a small gorge, whereupon I enclosed a well-fortified trench branching off to the right with solid cover. The gorge grew wider and wider until, at dawn, we came to a wide field. Turning back, we entered the right trench, which bore the marks of an unsuccessful attack. The ground was covered with dead Englishmen and military utensils. This was Siegfried's line. Suddenly the commander of the shock troops, 
Lieutenant Hoppenroth snatched a soldier's rifle and fired. He ran into an English sentry, who after a few grenades turned to flee, moved on, and immediately met resistance again. Hand grenades flew from both sides and burst with repeated crackling. The equipment of the shock troops entered the battle. Lines were passed to each other in a chain. Snipers settled behind the crossbeams, taking aim at the enemy mortars. Platoon commanders watched over the cover so as not to miss the counterattack and the mortarmen set up their guns in places that opened up the field of fire. After a brief battle, there were excited voices on the other side, and before we had a good idea what had happened, the first British came toward us with their arms held high. One by one, under the sight of our rifles and pistols, they rounded the crossbar and clicked their heels. They were all young, stout fellows in brand new uniforms. I let them pass with an emphatic hands down, and instructed one of the squad to lead them away. Some of them smiled trustingly, showing that they assumed nothing inhuman about us. Others tried to placate us by extending packs of cigarettes and bars of chocolate. With the increased joy of the savage, I saw that we had a rich catch. There was no end to the procession. We had already counted 150 men, and the new ones kept coming and coming with raised hands. I stopped one officer and asked him about the rest of the arrangement and equipment of the position. He answered very politely, adding to the favourable impression he made on me by standing at full stretch in front of me. He led me to the company commander, a wounded captain in a nearby adit. I saw a young man of about twenty-six years of age with thin features and a shot shin leaning against the planking. When I introduced myself, he put his hand with a gold chain hanging from it to his cap, gave me his name, and handed me the gun. The very first words he uttered revealed the man in front of me. We were surrounded about. He was anxious to explain to his adversary why his company had surrendered so quickly. We talked in French about various things. He told me that there was a whole group of German prisoners in a nearby shelter being cared for by his men. When I asked to what extent the Siegfried line was being held from the rear, he was evasive. After I promised to let both him and the other wounded men go, we said goodbye, shaking hands. My men in front of the adit reported that we had captured about 200 prisoners. For a company of eighty heads, not so bad. I set up the posts and we looked around in the conquered trench, which was packed with guns and miscellaneous articles of armament. On the posts were machine guns, mortars, hand grenades and bullets, flasks, fur vests, rubberized cloaks, raincoats, tents, tinned meat, jam, tea, coffee, cocoa and tobacco, bottles of brandy tools, pistols, rocket launchers, underwear, gloves in short. Everything imaginable. It's like a true landsnicked commander. I took a short break to let my men loot, take a break, and rummage through things. I, too, could not resist the temptation, and asked my valet to pick me something for breakfast near one of the adits and fill my pipe with good navy cut, while I wrote a report to the commander of the combat units. I thoughtfully sent a copy to our battalion commander, half an hour later in high spirits. I will not deny that this contributed to the English brandy. We were on the road again, and sneaking from one crossbeam to another, crossed the Siegfried line. In one of the blockhouses built into the trench, we got a fire and climbed up to the nearest post to look around. While we were exchanging bullets with the occupants of the area, someone's invisible fist filled one soldier to the ground. The bullet drilled through the top of his helmet and left a long furrow on his skull. The brain rose and fell in the wound with each shock of blood, but despite this, the injured man could still walk without support. I ordered him to drop his satchel, which he was in no way willing to part with, and conjured him to walk slowly and cautiously. I called for volunteers to attack to break the resistance in the open space. The men looked at each other uncertainly, and only one helpless Pole, whom I had always thought to be feeble-minded, climbed out of the trench and stepped heavily onto the blockhouse. Unfortunately, I have forgotten the name of this simple soldier, who taught me the lesson that you can only recognize a man by seeing him in trouble. That's when Fenrich Newper jumped in with his squad for cover as we advanced on the trench. The English fired a few volleys and retreated, leaving the blockhouse to its fate. One of Fenrich's men, in the midst of the attack, fell dead face down a few paces from the target. He had received that shot through the heart after which the dead man lies stretched out like a sleeper. As we advanced further we encountered fierce resistance from unseen grenadiers, and during the long fight we were again pushed back to the blockhouse. There we barricaded ourselves. On the section of the trench, for which there was a battle, and we and the British left a lot of corpses. Alas, among them was non-commissioned officer Mevius, remembered to me from the night battle of Reneville as a desperately brave fighter. He was lying down in a pool of blood. 
When I turned him over, I could see by the deep hole in his forehead that all help was useless. I had just been talking to him. Suddenly he fell silent without answering my question. When, a few seconds later, I went behind the crossbar behind which he had disappeared, I found him already dead. There was some ghastly mystery in this. After the enemy had retreated a little, a stubborn firefight ensued, during which Lewis's machine gun, 50 meters away, forced us to duck our heads. The hand machine gun on our side took up the challenge. For half a minute, sprayed with bullets, the two deadly guns rumbled against each other. Suddenly our gunner, Efritia Motolo, fell, struck in the head by a bullet. Though his brain had slid down his face to his knees, he did not lose consciousness even when we carried him to a neighboring adit. Mitulo, an elderly man, was one of those men who would never volunteer. But as he stood behind the machine gun I could see, without taking my eyes off his face, that in spite of the sheaf of fire spraying him from all sides, he did not tilt his head an inch. When asked how he felt, he answered me in still coherent sentences. I had the impression that the mortal wound was not causing him any suffering. Perhaps he was not aware of it. Gradually the fire began to subside, for the English had also begun to build a barricade. At twelve o'clock Captain von Brixen, Lieutenant Tebby, and Lieutenant Voigt appeared. They congratulated me on the success of the company. We climbed into the blockhouse, had a breakfast of English supplies, and discussed the situation. Shouting as hard as I could, I negotiated with about twenty-five Englishmen whose heads were sticking out of a trench, a hundred yards in front of us. Apparently they wanted to surrender, but as soon as I climbed to cover I was immediately fired upon from somewhere behind. Suddenly there was some movement at the barricade. Hand grenades flew, guns rattled, machine guns rumbled. They're coming, they're coming. We took cover behind sandbags and started shooting. One of my men, Efriman Kimpenhaus, jumped up on the barricade in a fighting frenzy and fired long into the trench until he was swept away by two heavy wounds in the arm. I remembered this hero of the moment and had the pleasure of congratulating him two weeks later on the Iron Cross, first class. Sadly had we returned from this interlude to breakfast when a wild uproar arose again. One of those strange accidents had occurred by which the battle situation suddenly changes unpredictably. But the shout came from the acting officer of the left of the neighbouring regiment. This man was trying to communicate with us and was in a very scraggly mood. He was slightly drunk which seemed to inflame the courage peculiar to his nature to a frenzy. Where's the Tommy? Jujo, dog faces. Come on, who's after me? In a fury he broke down our marvellous barricade and rushed forward, making his way with hand grenades. In front of him his orderly slid down the trench and finished off with rifle shots those who managed to escape from the explosives. Courage and personal fearlessness are always inspiring, and we were seized by this prowess and picking up hand grenades, zealously joined in this furious assault. I was soon near the officer, and the other officers, accompanied by men of my company, did not take long to beg. The battalion commander himself, Captain von Brixen, with rifle in hand, was in the front ranks, and over our heads he put down more than one enemy mortar man. The British defended themselves bravely. The fight was for every crossbar. Black balls of millimetre hand grenades crossed in the air with our hand grenades. Behind every crossbar we took we found corpses or bodies still convulsing. They killed each other without seeing each other's faces. We had casualties too. A piece of iron fell near the orderly, from which there was no escape. A soldier collapsed on the ground, and his blood streamed from several wounds at once. Jumping over his body, we moved on. Thunderous roars accompanied us. Among the dead terrain hundreds of eyes were tracking the target, pointing rifles and machine guns at it, we were already far from our lines. Shells were flying from all sides, whistling around our helmets or exploding with a hard crackling sound near the edge of the trench. Each time an egg-shaped iron lump appeared above the horizon line, the eye grasped it with that insight of which man is capable only when faced with death. During this moment of waiting it was necessary to get a position from which the whole sky could be clearly seen. For it was only against its pale background that the black corrugated iron of the deadly balls stood out clearly enough then one could throw oneself and move on. The body of the enemy, falling like a sack, was barely worth a glance. The killed one was out of the game, and a new fight began. Grenade shooting resembles fencing on rapiers. You have to make jumps, as in back. This is the deadliest of the fights. It ends only when one of the opponents explodes into the air. The dead men, over whom I had to jump all the time, I could look at these moments without a shudder. 
They lay sprawled loosely, in the posture peculiar to those moments when you part with life. During these jumps I was bickering with my officer, a really desperate fellow. He claimed to be the leader and demanded that I not throw the grenades myself, but hand them to him. Interspersed with the brief, intimidating exclamations used to regulate one's own, and call attention to the enemy's actions was the sudden cry, Throw! I was an assault battalion instructor. A trench branching off to the right we cleared for the men of the 225th Regiment following us. The trapped British tried to escape through the open space and were shot down like hares on the hunt. Then came the supreme moment. The exsanguinated enemy pursued at our heels was making every effort to escape through the connecting trench, which was deflecting to the right. We sprang to our posts and saw before us a sight that gave us a wild cry of exultee. The trench by which the English were leaving was curving like the wing of a lyre, returning back to us, and on the English side was not more than ten yards distant from us. There was no way for the enemy to get round us. From our post eminence directly in front of us, we could see the helmets of the Englishmen stumbling with haste and excitement. I threw a grenade under the feet of those ahead, so that they suddenly stopped, jamming those following. So an indescribable carnage began. Grenades flew through the air like snowballs, shrouding everything in a milky white mist. Two men uninterruptedly handed me ready-made mines. Flames erupted among the vise clenched Englishmen, tossing up shreds and helmets. Cries of rage and fear mingled with each other. Seeing nothing but fire, we rushed with clicks to the edge of the trench. The rifles of the whole area were aimed at us. In the midst of this blight, a violent jolt felled me to the ground. Coming to my senses, I tore my helmet off my head and, to my horror, saw two large holes in its metal. Found an unker non-commissioned officer Mormon, who jumped up to me, reassured me by assuring me that I had only a bleeding scratch on the back of my head. The bullet, fired at long range, had penetrated my helmet and grazed my skull, half stunned and hastily bandaged. I waddled back, moving away from the centre of the battle. As soon as I crossed the next crossbar, a soldier ran up behind me and shouted in a strained voice that Tebby had just been mortally wounded in the head on the same spot. This news absolutely crushed me. I refused to believe that my friend, endowed with such qualities with whom I had for years shared the joys, sorrows and dangers of war, who until a few minutes ago had cheered me up with jokes, had passed away because of some miserable piece of lead. Sadly, the truth was all too apparent. Together with him on that deadly piece of trench, all the non-commissioned officers, and a third of my company bled to death. Lieutenant Hopp, already a young man, a teacher by profession, a German Schulmeister in the best sense of the word, was also killed. Both my Fenrichs and a host of others were wounded. In spite of this, the seventh company under Lieutenant Hoppenroth, the last company commander, held its conquered position until the changeover. The battles of the World War have also had their great moments. Anyone who has seen these rulers of the trench with stern, determined faces, desperately brave, moving with flexible and elastic jumps, with a sharp and bloodthirsty look, knows this. Heroes not list trench warfare is the bloodiest, wildest, cruelest of all wars. But it also had men who lived to see their hour ire unknown but brave warriors. Among the exciting moments of war, none has such power as the meeting of the commanders of the two striking units between the narrow earthen walls of the trench. Here there can be neither retreat nor mercy. Blood is heard in the shrill cry of epiphany, a nightmare spewing from the chest. On my way back, I lingered near Captain von Brixen. He and a few men were fighting furiously with a group of heads sticking out from behind the edge of a neighbouring parallel trench. I stood between him and another gunner to watch the explosions. In the intoxication that accompanies painful shock, I didn't think about the fact that my bandage glistened like a white turban and could be seen far around me. Suddenly a frontal blow dropped me to the bottom of the trench again, and my eyes were blinded by the blood streaming down them. The soldier standing next to me groaned and collapsed, a direct hit to the head through the helmet and temple. The captain was afraid that he had lost his second company commander that day but on close examination he found only two superficial holes at the roots of the hair. They were caused either by a shell that had exploded or by steel fragments of a broken helmet. This wounded man, whose body was lodged in the metal of the same shell as mine, visited me after the war. He was a cigarette factory worker and had become morbid and cranky after his injury. Weakened by the new loss of blood, I joined the captain returning to his command post. Running through the severely shelled outskirts of the village of Miva, we found shelter in a canal bed where I was bandaged and given an injection against tetanus. 
After dinner, I got into a truck and drove to Lecluse, and there, at dinner, presented my report to Colonel von Oppen, half asleep, but also in excellent spirits, having drained a bottle of wine. I bowed out and with a sense of well-deserved rest after a hard day threw myself on the bed prepared by my faithful Fink. A day later the battalion entered Lecluse. On December 4 the divisional commander, Major General von Bass, made a speech before the active battalions, in which he emphasised the merits of the 7th Company. I could rightly be proud of my men. Some 80 men had conquered a large chunk of the trench, obtained an armful of machine guns, mortars, and miscellaneous material, and captured 200 prisoners. I was pleased to announce a whole host of promotions and honours. Thus, Lieutenant Hoppenrath, commander of the shock troops, Fenrich Newport, who stormed the blockhouse, and the brave defender of the barricade Kim Penhaus pinned on his chest, honoured Iron Cross of the first degree. Despite my fifth, now double, wound, I did not immediately seek out an infirmary, but timed my treatment to coincide with Christmas vacation. The scratch on the back of my head soon healed, and the splinter in my forehead grew into the fabric, keeping company with two others that had been lodged in my left arm and earlobe since Renierville. At the same time, I was unexpectedly pleased by the Knight's Cross of the House of Hohenzollern sent my way. This gold-rimmed enamel cross, a shot helmet and a silver glass with the inscription to the victor of Meva, presented to me by three company commanders of our battalion, I keep in memory of the double battle of Cambrai, which will go down in history as the first attempt to overcome the deadly hardships of positional warfare. On December 9, 1917, after a few days' rest, even before my furlough, we replaced the 10th Company in the front line. The position was, as I have already reported, near the village of Vaisen Artois. My company's station was bounded on the right by the Aris Cambra Highway, and on the left by the marshy bed of the Kojol Brook through which we kept in touch with the neighbouring company by setting up night patrols, owing to the elevated ground lying between the forward trenches. The enemy's position was not visible, except for a few patrols fiddling around our wire at night and the whirring of an electric motor placed on the neighbouring Hubert farm. The enemy infantry gave no signs of life, but trouble was caused by the frequent attacks of gas mines, which cost many casualties. Their source were hundreds of iron pipes dug into the ground which were electrically discharged by a volley of flames. As soon as a fire broke out, a gas alarm was sounded, and anyone who did not have time to put on a gas mask before the attack was in trouble. In some places, the gas reached almost absolute density, so that the gas mask did not help, because there was simply not enough inhaled oxygen, and because of that, there were casualties. My shelter was built into the steep wall of a gravel pit that gaped right behind the position, and was under heavy fire every day. Behind it the black silhouette of the iron hulk of a ruined sugar factory loomed. The gravel pit was an ominous place. Between the craters filled with the waste of war materials protruded the gnarled crosses of abandoned graves. At night you couldn't see even with a hand held up to your eyes, and you had to wait for the next flare to take off before you stepped off of the safe path of the cross-country grid into the viscous mud of the Kojol Valley. If I wasn't busy building a post trench, I spent my days in the icy adit, reading a book and tapping my feet against the frame to keep warm. A bottle of green mint liquor hidden in a niche in the chalk rock served the same purpose, to which my orderly and I were eager to salute. If only we could light a fire in our quarry, thus illuminating the dim December sky, the whole area would soon become uninhabited, for the enemy had so far taken the sugar factory as the seat of command and expended the main portion of his shells on this old iron ruin. Life thus returned to our stiffened members only in the hours of dawn. A fire was kindled in the little stove, and besides the thick chad, it spread a cosy warmth. From the stairs leading to the adit, the clatter of wokes was soon heard. This meant that the food bearers, eagerly expected, had returned from the vis. And if the invariable sequence of rutabagas, pearls, and dried vegetables was broken by noodles or beans, there was no need for anything better. I was quite happy to sit at my little table and listen to the ingenuous conversation of the people. Shrouded in tobacco smoke, they huddled around the stove, on which, emitting spicy odours, stood a cauldron of great war and peace, battle and home, vacations and retreats, we all discussed in a dry Lower Saxon manner, and I memorised, as usual, some apt expression. Thus, for instance, a resident who was going on leave would say goodbye with the words, Brothers, how good it is to lie in one's bed again, 
and your mama is caressing you under your side. On January 19 at four o'clock in the morning came the shift, and we set out in a heavy snowstorm to Guy, where we were to remain for a long time to prepare for the big assault. From Ludendorff's extremely clear training orders, communicated to everyone, including company commanders, we learned that an attempt would be made as soon as possible to decide the outcome of the war by a single powerful blow. We memorized forgotten forms of rifle combat and maneuver warfare, and spent a lot of time on rifle and machine gun shooting. Since all the villages behind the front line down to the last attic were occupied, any embankment was used as a firing range, and bullets sometimes buzzed over the terrain as if during a battle. The commander of my company, during a drill, knocked the commander of a foreign regiment out of his saddle with a hand machine gun. Fortunately, the victim was only slightly wounded in the leg. Several times I with my company, armed with live grenades, undertook training attacks on complex trench systems, testing the experience of the Battle of Cambrai. Here, too, there were casualties. On January 24, Colonel von Oppen bade us farewell to take the brigade to Palestine. Since the fall of 1914, he had been in continuous command of the regiment whose military history is closely associated with his name. Colonel von Oppen was a living example of a born commander. He was a representative of the chief race. He was always surrounded by an atmosphere of order and confidence. A regiment is the last unit in which all still know each other personally. In a sense, it is a vast military family, and the image of such a commander invisibly exerts its influence on thousands. Unfortunately, his parting words, goodbye in Hanover, they were not destined to come true. He soon died of Asiatic cholera. Already after I learned of his death, I received another letter written by him in his own hand. I am grateful to him for many things. On February 6, we moved again to Le Clouse, and on the 22nd were placed in the funnels on the left of the Durian-de-Court Highway to begin trench work on the front line during the night. As I examined the position against the pile of rubble of the former village of Bullecourt, I realized that the mighty offensive, which had been whispered about with hope all along the Western Front, was partly to take place here. Everywhere construction was feverishly going on, Adits were being built and new tracks were being laid. The field was dotted with tablets with mysterious figures, apparently indicating the location of batteries and command posts. Our airplanes were relentlessly making barrage flights, blocking the enemy's view. In order to provide the troops with accurate time, every day at 12 o'clock precisely, a black balloon was lowered from the tethered balloons which disappeared at exactly 12.10. At the end of the month we again went to guide to our former quarters. After abundant exercises in battalion and regimental formations, we rehearsed the breakthrough of the entire division twice in a spacious position marked with white ribbons. Finally, the divisional commander made a speech to the officers, from which it became clear that the assault would begin in the coming days. The iron spirit of the attack, the spirit of the Prussian infantry, hovered over the masses who had gathered here on the Normandy front at the awakening of spring for a battle test. With a joyous feeling I recall those evening hours, when we sat around the round table and talked fervently about the coming manoeuvre warfare. And it did not matter if in the heat of excitement the last tailor was spent on wine. What would we have money for on the other side of the enemy's lines? Much less in that better world. It was only by reminding us that life in the rear was not quite over that Captain von Brixen managed to keep us from bombarding the walls with glasses, bottles and china the next evening. The team, too, was in good shape. We could hear the boys in their dry Lower Saxon manner talking about the upcoming horse attack according to Hindenburg's plan, and it was clear that they would go for the assault as hard, confident, and quiet as ever. On March 17, after sunset, we left our beloved quarters and set out for Brunemont. The roads were crowded with tirelessly marching columns, countless guns, and endless wagons. Despite this, order reigned. Everything went according to the mobilization plan drawn up by the officers of the general staff. Woe to the unit that did not adhere to the time and route with pedantic precision. It was mercilessly dumped in a ditch and waited for hours to squeeze into some gap. Once we got into a crash, which caused Captain von Brixen's horse to run into a nailed drawbar and lose its breath. The battalion was stationed at Brunemont Castle. We learned that on the night of March 19 we were to move to the front line to take a waiting position in the craters near Cagnacourt and that the great assault was scheduled for the morning of March 21, 1918. The regiment had the task of breaking between the villages of Ecu saint main and Norre, known from the retreat on the Same, and, if the opportunity arose to reach Mori on the first day, 
I sent forward Schmidt, who we called no other than Schmidtchen on account of his complacent disposition, to provide lodging for the company. At the appointed time, the battalion marched out of Brunemont. At the crossroads, where our advanced units were waiting for us, the companies split up and moved forward in a radial fashion. When we reached the height of the second line, on which we were to be stationed, it was found that our lead units were lost. Wandering over poorly lighted, viscous, rugged terrain and questioning endless, equally ill-informed squads began. In order not to wear out the team completely, I ordered everyone to stop and sent scouts in different directions. The squads laid down their rifles and squeezed into the huge crater, while Lieutenant Springer and I settled down on the edge of the smaller one. From where, as from a balcony, we could see the big crater below. For some time now, about a hundred meters in front of us, sporadic explosions had been erupting. Another shell exploded a short distance away. Shrapnel slapped the earthen walls of the crater. Someone screamed, assuring me he was wounded in the leg. I shouted for my men to move to the neighboring pits, and I began to feel the mud-covered boot of the injured man, looking for a puncture wound. High in the air, there was another whistling sound. Everyone was seized with a premonition. It was for us. Immediately there was a deafening, monstrous rumble. A shell had fallen right between us. I got up, half stunned. The ignited cartridge belts emitted a bright pink light from a large funnel. It illuminated trickles of smoke from a po hole where a pile of black bodies was tumbling. The shadows of survivors scattered in all directions. All this was accompanied by non-stop horrible howls and cries for help. But especially terrible was the swirling movement of the dark mass in the depths of the smoking and blazing cauldron, which for one second, like an infernal vision, opened the deepest abyss of pain. I will not conceal that at first I, like all the others, jumped up and rushed headlong into the darkness after a moment's chilling horror. It was only when I found myself in the small vortex into which I had rolled that I realized what was happening. See and hear nothing. Run as far away as you can. Crawl into a crevice. And then another voice came in. Listen, you're the commander. So I forced myself back into that nightmare. On the way I ran into Gunner Hauler, who had taken a machine gun as a trophy during my November patrol, and I went with him. The wounded were still making horrified cries. Some, hearing my voice, would crawl up to me and whimper her lieutenant. Her lieutenant. One of my favorite recruits, Jasinski, whose thigh had been shattered by shrapnel, clung tightly to my legs. To do something to help, I patted him on the shoulder, encouraging him with a swear word. Moments like this are etched in memory. I entrusted the unfortunates to the only surviving orderly to lead the handful of loyal companions gathered around me out of the dangerous neighborhood. Half an hour ago, I had been at the head of a valiant, excellent company, and now I was wandering helplessly through a trench maze with a handful of utterly depressed men. Some young man who only a short time ago, ridiculed by his comrades, cried during the line because of the heavy boxes of ammunition, was now conscientiously dragging behind him this heavy load which he had rescued from the nightmare of the rifle stage. This observation shocked me. I threw myself to the ground and broke into convulsive sobs, while my men grimly encircled me. Under the threat of exploding shells, after running for several hours in vain through trenches whose mud and water were up to our ankles, we climbed, mortally exhausted, into the ammunition niches built into the walls. Finky pulled his blanket over me, but still I could not sleep a wink and, smoking a cigar, waited with a feeling of utter indifference for the dawn. The first ray of morning illuminated the incredible excitement on our crater field. Untold infantry units were trying to reach cover. Artillerymen were hauling ammunition, mortarmen were pulling their carts, telephonists and signalmen were establishing communications. It was pure fairground hustle and bustle a thousand meters from the enemy, who most improbably took no notice of anything. Fortunately, I ran into the commander of the Second Machine Gun Company, Lieutenant Follenstein, an old frontline officer, who showed me our shelter. His first phrase was, Look, what do you look like? I took my men into a large adit, past which we had run at least twelve times during the night, and where I found Schmidtchen, who as yet knew nothing of our troubles. I found here also our guides. From that day on, whenever we took a new position, I always selected my guides myself and did so with the greatest circumspection. War teaches thoroughly, but it demands a high price for teaching. After stationing my companions, I set off to the scene of the nightmare of the previous night. The terrain looked terrible. Around the scorched crater lay over twenty blackened corpses, almost all torn beyond recognition. Some of the dead we later classified as missing, 
as there was nothing left of them. Some soldiers from neighbouring bays were busy pulling blood-soaked belongings of the dead out of the monstrous dump and examining them in the hope of making a profit. I chased them away and gave my liaison a mission to retrieve wallets and valuables to save them for the rest of us. True enough, the next day during the assault we had to abandon them. To my joy, Lieutenant Sprenger came from a nearby adit with a group of men who had spent the night there. I ordered the squad commanders to report and found that I had 36 more men at my disposal. The day before, I had marched out in the best of spirits, with a detachment numbering over 150. I managed to discover over 20 more dead, and over 60 more wounded, many of them later deceased. The only faint consolation was that it could have been worse. Rifleman Rust, for example, was so close to the explosion that the carrying straps of his ammunition boxes began to burn. Non-commissioned officer Pego who unfortunately died the next day, was standing between two men who had been blown to pieces without even being scratched. We spent the day in a depressed mood and slept most of the time. I often ran to the battalion commander as more and more questions arose in connection with the assault. The rest of the time, lying on the bunks, I talked with both my officers about trifles, driving away agonizing thoughts. The constant refrain was, nothing will be worse than a bullet. Thank God. The little speech with which I tried to cheer up the men sitting silently on the stairs had no effect. Nor was I in the mood to cheer anyone up. At ten o'clock in the evening the liaison brought the order to move to the front line. When a wild beast is torn out of its cave, or when a sailor sees a lifeboard floating away from under his feet, their feelings are perhaps comparable to those we felt when we parted from a safe, warm at it, and set out into the inhospitable night. After running under the heaviest shrapnel fire of the Felix Trench, we arrived at the front without loss. While we were making our way through the trenches, artillery was coming over the bridges over our heads into advanced firing positions. The regiment whose forward battalion we were had been assigned a very narrow section. The tunnels were immediately overflowing with men. Those who remained dug holes in the walls of the trench to at least shelter themselves from the artillery fire that preceded the assault. After much searching, everyone found a spot. Captain von Brixen again called the company commanders to a meeting. Having checked our watches for the last time, we parted after shaking hands, while waiting for five. Five moment when the fire training was to begin, I settled down on the stairs with both my officers. The mood improved somewhat as the rain had stopped and the starry night promised a dry morning. We passed the time over stories and food. There was much smoking and a full flask going round and round. In the first morning hours the enemy's artillery became so animated that we were afraid whether the English had sniffed out anything. Several stacks of ammunition distributed over the area. Just before the start, the following was broadcast over the radio. His Majesty, the Kaiser and Hindenburg have entered the arena of war. This message was greeted with applause. As the hand moved further and further away, we counted the last minutes. Finally it stopped at five. Five. The hurricane had broken. A curtain of flame, accompanied by a sharp, unheard roar, surged upwards. The frenzied thunder, which absorbed the heaviest volleys with its mighty booms, shook the earth. The inordinate roar of destruction, raised from behind the untold guns, was so terrible that even the greatest of the battlefields seemed like child's play in comparison. What we dared not hope for happened. The enemy's artillery was silent. It was swept away by a single powerful blow. We could not stay in the adit. Standing on the shelter, we gazed with delight at the high, tower-like wall of fire blazing over the British trenches, covered by swirling blood-red clouds. Our joy was spoiled by a painful burning of the mucous membranes, causing tears. The vapours from our own gas shells, driven in by the headwind, enveloped us in a strong odour of bitter almonds. I watched anxiously as someone was already coughing and gasping and finally pulled off his gas mask. Seeing this, I myself tried to suppress coughing fits and manage my breathing. Gradually the smoke cleared and in a second we had our gas masks off. It was daylight. Behind our backs a monstrous rumbling sound was constantly growing and in front of us there was a wall of smoke, ash and gas impenetrable to the eye. Men ran through the trench roaring cheers in each other's ears. Infantrymen and artillerymen, engineers and telephone operators, Prussians and Bavarians, officers and whole teams, all expressed delight at this spontaneous display of our strength and were impatient to begin the assault at exactly nine. Forty. At eight. 
Twenty-five, the heavy mortars, standing in the narrow corridors behind the front trench, entered the fray. We saw two hundred kilogram mines flying through the air, describing large trajectories, and somewhere in the distance volcanic explosion hit the ground. Their explosions stretched a dense chain of erupting craters. It seemed that the very laws of nature had lost their power. The air sparkled as it did on hot summer days, and its changing density made solid objects dance. Black streaks of shadows glided through the clouds. The howl became absolute. It could not be heard. Only vaguely visible was the thousands of rear machine guns whipping their leaden fountains into the sky. The last hour of preparation was more dangerous than the four preceding hours, during which we could move quietly about the shelter. The enemy had thrown a heavy battery into the fire, a stream of shells showering our overcrowded trench, fleeing from them. I went to the left and came upon the adjutant, Lieutenant Hines, who inquired of Baron von Selemicher. He is taking command of the battalion. Captain von Brixen has just been killed. Shocked by this terrible news, I wandered back and crawled into a deep hole. But in my short journey I had already forgotten about it. My brain was only attached to reality by the number nine. Four. In front of my hole stood the non-commissioned officer Duziskan, who had accompanied me to Renierville. He asked me to move into the trench, as at the slightest concussion blocks of earth might fall on me. Bout he wrench and intercepted his words. With his leg torn off, he collapsed to the ground. Jumping over him, I ran to the right, where I climbed into a hole already occupied by two sapper officers. Quite near us, the heavy shells continued to rage. Suddenly, black clods of earth whirled up out of the white cloud. The explosion was swallowed up by the general rumble. Nothing more was heard at all. In a corner of the trench to our left, three of my company were blown to pieces. One of the last unexploded shells killed poor Schmitchen, who was sitting on the ladder. Together with Springer, with watch in hand, I stood near my hole waiting for the great moment. Around us the remnants of the company had gathered. We managed to cheer them up with coarse, unpretentious jokes and to amuse them a little. Lieutenant Meyer, who for a moment looked out from behind the crossbar, later told me that he thought we were crazy. At nine. Ten, the officer patrols guarding our position left the trench. Since the two positions were 800 metres apart, we had to move out while still in preparation and so positioned ourselves in no man's land to break into the first enemy line at 9.40. A few minutes later, Springer and I, accompanied by our men, also climbed into cover. Let's show what the 7th Company can do. I don't care anymore. Avenge the 7th Company. Avenge Captain von Brixen, drawing our pistols. We swung over the wire, through which the first wounded were already climbing toward us. I looked to the right and to the left. The line dividing the nations presented a strange picture. In the craters in front of the enemy's trench, around which the fire was raging all the time, on an immensely broad front, huddled together in bunches by companies, the assault battalions were patiently waiting for their hour. At the sight of these accumulated huge masses, it seemed the breakthrough was inevitable was not hidden in U.S. a force capable of splitting the enemy's reserves and tearing them apart, destroying them? I waited for it with confidence. There seemed to be a final battle to be fought, a final throw. Here the fate of nations was subjected to an iron judgment. It was a question of the possession of the world. I guessed, though I did not fully realize the significance of the hour, and I think that everyone understood that the personal vanished before the power of the responsibility that fell upon him. Those who have experienced such moments know that the rise and fall in the history of nations depend on the fate of battles. The mood was marvellous. The supreme tension had heated it up. The officers maintained their martial poise and excitedly exchanged jokes. Often a heavy mine would fall very close by, throwing up a fountain as high as a bell tower and covering the waiting men with earth without anyone thinking of ducking their heads. The rumbling of the battle became so terrible that the mind was disturbed. There was a kind of overwhelming power in the rumble that left no room for fear in the heart. Everyone became furious and unpredictable, being transported into some superhuman landscape. Death lost its meaning, the will to live shifted to something greater, and it made everyone blind and indifferent to their own fate. Three minutes before the attack, my trooper, a loyal finzer, beckoned me with a filled flask. I took a deep sip. It was like drinking water. All that was missing was a combat cigar. An air wave extinguished my match three times. The great moment had arrived. A shaft of fire swept across the front trenches. We went on the offensive. 
with mixed feelings of bloodlust, rage, and intoxication, we marched hard but steadily, advancing on the enemy lines. I marched away from the company, accompanied by Finker and one recruit named Hake. My right hand clutched the hilt of my pistol, my left clutched a bamboo stack. I was seething with a frenzied rage that seized me and all of us in the most incomprehensible way. The desire to slay, which was beyond my strength, quickened my steps. Fury squeezed bitter tears out of me. The monstrous will to annihilate, which lay heavy over the battlefield, condensed in my brain and plunged it into a red mist. We stammered and stammered and shouted jerky phrases at each other, and an indifferent spectator would probably have thought that we were overwhelmed by an overabundance of happiness. Without the slightest difficulty, we crossed the tattered and tangled barbed wire and leaked over the first, barely recognisable trench. The assault wave danced across the flattened gully like a roundel of ghosts through the white, swirling vapours. Suddenly a machine gun crackled toward us from the second line. I jumped with my companions into the ravine. A second later there was a terrible rumble, and I fell forward. Finky grabbed me by the collar and turned me over on my back. Her lieutenant, are you wounded? Nothing was discovered. The recruit had a hole in his shoulder, and he assured me with a groan that the bullet had hit him in the spine. We stripped him of his uniform and bandaged him up. The long furrow was a sign that shrapnel had hit the edge of the crater at the level of our faces. It was a miracle we were alive. Meanwhile, the others had gotten ahead of us. We rushed after them, leaving the wounded man to his own fate, but still managed to stick a board with a white piece of gauze next to him, for the orderlies who followed the stormers. To our left, as lant from us a huge railroad embankment he cost, Croiseal, which we had to cross, grew out of the fog. From the embrasures and windows built into the tunnels, there was such dense rifle and machine gun fire as if a large bag of peas had been turned out. Finky had gone somewhere too. I walked through the gorge, on both sides of which were gaping dugouts, pressed into the embankment. In fury I walked on the black, disturbed ground still smoking with the poisonous gases of our shells. I was all alone, and suddenly I saw the first enemy. Someone, apparently wounded with his hands on the ground, was squirming about twenty paces away from me in the middle of a ravine. I saw the figure straighten up at my appearance and stare at me with wide open eyes, while I, hiding my face behind my pistol, approached it slowly and spitefully. It was a bloody scene without an audience. What a relief to see at last the enemy in front of me with my own quitting my teeth, I put the muzzle to the temple of the unfortunate man, paralysed with fear, and with the other hand clutched at his uniform. With a pitiful groan, he reached into his pocket and held a picture card up to my eyes. It was a portrait of him with his large family, like some spell from a bygone, incredibly distant world. By some miracle, I managed to curb my insane rage and move on. And in some above, men from my company jumped down into the ravine toward me. I was unbearably hot. I tore off my overcoat and threw it up. I also shouted vigorously several times. Now Lieutenant Junger will take off his overcoat and the rifleman laughed as if I had said something quite witty. Upstairs everyone ran for cover, paying no attention to the machine guns, which were at most 400 metres away from us. The instinct of annihilation was pulling me into those whirlwinds of fire. I climbed to the fire-breathing embankment. In one of the funnels I came upon a pistol-firing figure in corduroy. It was Kias, who was in the same mood. Instead of greeting me, he shoved a whole handful of ammunition at me. From this I concluded that I had shot a good deal on my short journey, for I had stocked up my ammunition thoroughly before the assault. But I have no personal memories of this period of time. The situation was such that we were separated from the railroad embankment, which towered before us like a mighty rampart, by a rugged field strewn with hundreds of dead Englishmen. In this field, as in an anthill, countless single battles were played out, Later, Cuse gave me details which I took with about as much feeling as if I had heard a third-person account of the wild antics of someone in a drunken rage. For instance, with hand grenades, he had chased some Englishmen around a section of the trench. When the grenades ran out, he replaced them with hard lumps of earth to keep his enemy on the run all the time. While Cuse was telling the story, I stood on the shelter and choked with laughter. So with adventures like these, we stealthily reached the embankment, which relentlessly, like a perpetual motion machine, scattered the fire. Here again my recollections begin, and it is with a sense of the extremely favourable fighting conditions. The bullets spared us, and as we stood close to the embankment, it turned from an obstacle into our shelter. As if awakened from a deep sleep, I saw that German helmets were approaching us across the torn field. 
they were growing out of the earth, ploughed by fire like an iron crop. At the same time I saw that right at my feet, someone was firing from the sack-covered window of the Adit. The noise was so great that we recognised only by the shaking of the muzzle that the weapon was in action. The defender of the Adit was only an arm's length away from us. In this close proximity to the enemy was our salvation. At such moments the heart overflows with demoniacal joy. I shot through the cloth. The soldier next to me tore it off and threw a grenade into the hole. The impact and the white cloud streaming from it left no doubt of the effect produced. The means was crude, but tried. We ran along the embankment to treat the next hatches in a similar manner and crush the resistance. Thus we tore the main vertebrae out of the backbone of the enemy's defences. I raised my hand, signalling to our men whose shells flew from a little distance, ringing in their ears. They nodded cheerfully. A hundred others and I immediately climbed the embankment. It was the first time in the whole war that I had seen one mass break into another. The British occupied two terrorist trenches on the rear embankment. The firefight was at short range, grenades falling in high trajectories through the air. I jumped into the first trench. Rushing behind the nearest crossbar, I came upon an English officer, his uniform unbuttoned and his tie dangling. Relinquishing my pistol, I seized him by the throat and threw him on a sandbag in front of which he collapsed. From behind appeared the grey head of the Major, who shouted to me, Finish the dog. I left that work to the next, taking up the lower trench, which was swarming with Englishmen, and began to shoot them with such fierceness that after the last shot I pulled the trigger ten more times. A soldier near me was throwing grenades at the fleeing men. A saucer-shaped helmet whirled into the air. The fight was decided in a minute. The British jumped out of the trenches and across the open space rushed to their battalions. From the crest of the embankment a frantic fire rained down frantically upon them in pursuit. The fleeing fell to the ground, and in a few seconds the ground was covered with corpses. Few escaped. I snatched my rifle from a non-commissioned officer who was watching the spectacle with his mouth hanging open. My first victim was an Englishman, plucked by me at a distance of 150 yards from the middle between two Germans. He folded up like a penknife and remained lying there. The two Germans stopped for a moment, perplexed as to where the help had come from, and immediately continued on their way. Having done all the work, they moved on. Success red-hot the aggressiveness and recklessness of each to the white heat. Command of United Formations was out of the question. Despite this, everyone knew only one password, and everyone rushed forward. I chose as my target a small hill on which I could see the ruins of a house, a grave cross and a broken airplane. My stubborn determination to advance led me to the wall of fire of my own firing rampart. I had to throw myself into a funnel to take cover and wait out the further march of fire. Beside me I found a young officer of another regiment, who, like myself, was alone rejoicing in the success of the first attack. The general enthusiasm in a few moments brought us so close together, as if we had known each other for years. The next jump separated us forever. Even these terrifying moments were not without their funny moments. The soldier next door to me, with his rifle to his cheek, was about to shoot, as in hunting, a poor hare that had ventured across our lines. It was so ridiculous that I couldn't help laughing. Nothing could be more frightening than if some daredevil decided to have some more fun. Next to the ruins of the house was a small trench, the bottom of which was combed on that side by machine guns. Spreading out, I jumped into it I counted out to be unoccupied. Just then Lieutenants Caius and von Wedelstedt appeared. Wedelstedt's last liaison, wounded in the eye, had no time to jump and collapsed dead. Seeing how this last of his company had been hit, Wedelstedt ducked into the wall of the trench and wept. He himself did not live to see the end of the day. There was a strongly fortified position in the gully, and in front of it on both thickened edges of the gully were two machine gun firing points. A shaft of fire had already swept across this position. The enemy seemed to have rested and was firing wherever he could. We were removed from it by a strip of 500 metres. Above it, like swarms of bees, buzzing sheaves of exploding shells. Having had a break, a small handful of us rushed from our trench to the enemy. The fight was not for life, but for death. In a few jumps my companion and I found ourselves face to face against the left machine gun point. From behind a small earth rampart I could clearly see a head in a flat helmet, and next to it a thin column of smoke curling upward. I approached in short leaps, wasting no time in taking aim, and ran in a zigzag pattern to ward off the muzzle of the rifles. Every time I lay down, a soldier tossed me a clip of ammo and I managed to get a few accurate shots off. 
Amo, Amo. When I looked back, I saw a soldier lying on his side, squirming in spasms. To the left, where the resistance was not yet so strong, a few men appeared who could reach the defenders with hand grenades. The last jump, and I, tripping over the iron wire, flew into the trench. The British, shelled from all sides, dropped their weapons and rushed to the right trench. The machine gun stood, half hidden under a huge pile of brass casings. It was red hot and still smoking. In front of it lay a figure of athletic build, whose eye had been blown out by a shot in the head, which was on my conscience. The huge man with the large white eyeball under the charred skull had an intimidating appearance. As I was thirsty, I did not stay here long, but went in search of water. One adit attracted me. I looked in and saw a man down below who was spreading out cartridge belts on his knees, putting them in order. Apparently he had not yet realized how the situation had changed. I calmly took aim at him, but did not fire at once, as caution suggested, but first shouted, Come here, hands up. He jumped up, looked at me dazedly, and disappeared into the darkness of the air. I threw a grenade after him. Probably there was another way out of the tunnel because an unknown man appeared behind the crossbar and laconically announced. The shooters are finished. At last I found a tin box of cool water. I took large gulps of the oily liquid, filled an English flask, and gave way to the others who suddenly crowded the trench. As a curiosity, I will mention that when I found myself in this machine gun nest, my first thought was of the cold I was then suffering from. Tin flame tonsils had been plaguing me for some time. I immediately seized my throat and found to my delight that the first-class steam bath I had left behind me had cured them. Meanwhile, the machine gun nest and the command of the gorge, which lay sixty yards ahead of us, continued to resist viciously. The boys defended themselves with true brilliance. We tried pointing an English machine gun at them, but without success. Moreover, while we were trying to do so, a shell whistled near my head, grazed the gamekeeper lieutenant standing beside me, and dangerously wounded one soldier in the thigh. The handgun crew, being luckier, brought their gun to the edge of our little trench crescent and drove a whole series of shells into the flank of the British. This momentary confusion was taken advantage of by the attackers on the right, and led by our, so far intact, Ninth Company under Lieutenant Hipkins, rushed upon the gorge. From all the ravines rose up waving figures with rifles, and with wild cries of hurrah, attacked the enemy's position, from which hundreds of the defenders came out with raised arms. Their mercy was given to anyone. The British, with arms held high, rushed through the first assault wave back to where the fury of the battle had not yet reached the boiling point. Hipkins's ordinarian had put down at least a dozen with his thirty-two shot pistol. I watched this carnage, played out on the edge of our little earthen fortification, with as close a scrutiny as from a theatre box. Here I realised that a defender who, at a distance of five paces, drives bullets into the belly of an invader, cannot expect mercy. The fighter who at the moment of attack has a bloody mist covering his eyes does not want to take prisoners, he wants to kill. He sees nothing in front of him and is in the grip of powerful primitive instincts. It is only the sight of pouring blood that dispels the fog in his brain. He looks around as if he had awakened from a heavy sleep. Only then does he become a conscious warrior again and is ready for a new tactical task. This was our condition after the capture of the gorge. The men of the different regiments had flocked here and stood huddled together, trying to shout over each other. The officers pointed with their canes to the continuation of the gully, and the powerful fighting mass continued its march with surprising indifference. The gully ended in an eminence on which the enemy's columns appeared. We advanced, halting and firing from time to time, until we were stopped by a heavy fire. It is an agonizing sensation to have bullets cracking and crashing into the ground at your very head. Kiss, who had returned, picked up a flattened shell that fell half a meter from his nose. At the same moment, somewhere to our left, a shell slammed into a soldier's helmet, echoing throughout the hollow. We took advantage of the slight pause to reach one of the less frequent funnels. Many officers of our battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Lindenberg, had already gathered there, for Baron von Solomacher too had been mortally wounded in the stomach on the railroad embankment. On the right slope of the ravine, amidst the machine gun fire, Lieutenant Breyer, who had been seconded to us from the 10th Jager, was walking about to everyone's amusement. With a long hunting cigar in his mouth and a gun slung over his shoulder, he waved his cane as if he were going on a hare hunt. We briefly told each other of our adventures, offering flasks and chocolate, 
and then by mutual desire moved forward again. The machine guns threatened apparently from the flank disappeared. In this time we had made three or four kilometres, the gully was swarming with shock troops. As far as the eye could see, they were advancing in chains, in columns of one, and in squads. Unfortunately, we were standing too tightly. How many we lost during the assault, to our good fortune, did not. Meeting no resistance, we reached the heights. Several khaki-clad figures jumped out of the right trench, at whose backs we fired from the elbow. Most of them immediately fell. The height was fortified by a number of dugouts. Smoke clouds were a sign that in some cases the hand grenades had been acted upon without ceremony. Some of the occupants coming out with hands raised and knees trembling. Their flasks and cigarettes were taken from them and pointed in the direction of the rear, where they fled with the greatest speed. One young Englishman was about to surrender to me when he suddenly turned around and disappeared back into his dugout. As, in spite of my demand that he come out, he persisted in staying down. We put an end to his slowness by means of grenades and went on. The narrow path disappeared on the other side of the heights. A road sign indicated that the path led to Vrocour. While the others were still cowering at the dugouts, Lieutenant Hines and I went over the height. Across the field lay the ruins of the village of Vrocour. In front of it flashed the shots of a firing battery, whose calculation at the first assault wave fled into the village. The team, stationed in several dugouts built into the gorge, jumped out of there and fled too. One I shot as he ran out of the entrance to the first dugout. With two men from my company who had time to report themselves, I entered the gorge. There was an occupied position on the right of it, with heavy firing coming from its side. We returned to the first dugout, and the shells of both parties immediately whistled over it. Apparently it served as a shelter for the battery's liaison and cyclists. In front of it lay my Englishman, a very young lad. My shot had crushed his skull. It is strange to look into the eyes of a man whom one has shot oneself. We paid no attention to the increasing fire, but settled down in the dugout and pared down the food we had left there, for our stomachs reminded us that we had not had a dry crumb in our mouths during the assault. We found ham, white bread jam, and an earthen bottle of ginger liquor. I sat down on an empty biscuit box and thumbed through a few English magazines, which were filled with tasteless and tasteless attacks on the Huns. Gradually we grew bored, and we made a short dash back to the beginning of the gorge, where a large crowd had already gathered. From there, to the left of Vrocur, a battalion of the 164th was visible. We decided to attack the village, and again ran forward along the gorge. Not far from the outskirts of the village our own artillery, which had been obstinately shelling the same place until the morning blocked our way. A heavy shell burst right on the road and killed four men. The rest of us rushed back. I learned later that the artillery had been ordered to continue firing from a long distance. This incomprehensible order wrested from our hands the best fruits of victory. Gritting our teeth, we were forced to stop in front of a wall of fire. To find a gap in this flame, we again went to the right, where the company commanders of the 76th Infantry Regiment were just beginning the assault on the Vrocourt position. We joined them with shouts of hurrah, but, having scarcely advanced, were again knocked out by our own artillery. Rawling, we occupied several funnels, where we were greatly annoyed by the fire unleashed by the grenades, which caused many wounded to die. British bullets also laid down a few men, such as my company's Sergeant Grutzmacher. Dawn was slowly approaching. In places the rifle fire flared up again, gradually fading. The exhausted soldiers began to look for a place to sleep. The officers shouted their names relentlessly, rallying the scattered companies. Twelve men of the 7th had clustered around me during the last hour. As it was getting cold, I led them to a small dugout in front of which my Englishman lay, and sent them out to search among the wounded for blankets and overcoats. Having dispersed all, I gave vent to my curiosity, and looked into the artillery hollow lying before us. It was a matter of private pleasure, so I took with me a rifleman named Howler, who had adventurous tendencies. With rifles at the ready, we set off down the ravine, in which our own fire was still rampant, and first of all explored a dugout apparently abandoned shortly before by the British officers. On one table was placed a huge gramophone, which Harla immediately turned on. The cheerful tune that sprang from the record made an eerie impression on us. I threw the box to the ground where it made a few more slithering sounds and fell silent. The dugout was furnished in the highest degree of coziness. There was even a small fireplace with armchairs around it and tobacco and smoking pipes on its beam. Merry old England.
he forced himself, and we took only what we liked. I chose a duffel bag, underwear, a small metal bottle of whiskey, a clipboard, and some charming toilet articles from Roger and Hal, probably fond memories of a front vacation in Paris. It was evident that the occupants had fled in a terrible hurry. In the little room next door was the kitchen, and we gazed at its supplies with awestruck amazement. There was a crate of raw eggs, a good quantity of which we immediately sucked up, for we knew them by hearsay. Along the walls were stacks of tinned meat, boxes of excellent concentrated jam, bottles of coffee extract, tomatoes and onions. In short, everything a gourmet could wish for. This picture often came to my mind when we were stuck in the trenches for weeks on meagre bread rations, watery soup and liquid jam. After a glance at the economic conditions of the enemy, which could only be envied, we left the dugout and stepped into the gorge, where we immediately found two new ownerless guns. Piles of glistening, freshly shot cartridges testified that during the attack they had also said their weighty word. I took a piece of chalk and wrote on them the number of my company, but as subsequent experience showed, the successors did not observe the right of the victor at all. Each squad erased the mark of the previous one and replaced it with its own until the mark of some chancel company was fixed on both guns. We then returned, as our own artillery jammed us ceaselessly with its iron. The advanced line, which had been replenished during our absence by newly arrived units, was two hundred yards behind us. I posted a double post in front of the dugout and ordered the others not to let go of their rifles. Having settled the order of the shift, hastily eaten and written down in the main the day's events, I fell asleep. At one o'clock we were roused by shouts of hurrah, and a lively fire from the right. Grabbing our rifles, we ran out of the room and positioned ourselves in a large crater. From the front line came a number of Germans fired from our line. Two of them were left lying on the road. Taught by this incident, we waited until the first excitement had subsided behind us, coordinated shouting, our actions, and returned to the line. There was Lieutenant Kozik, the second company commander, who had been wounded in the arm and could not open his mouth because of a cold, and with him about sixty men of the 73rd. As he had to go to the dressing station, I took command of his detachment, which contained three officers. The regiment had two other similarly hastily composed units of Hipkins and Forbeck. I spent the rest of the night with a few non-commissioned officers of the second company in a small hole, where we stiffened from the cold. In the morning I had a breakfast of captured provisions and sent men to Kiant to bring coffee and food from the kitchen. Our artillery took up its damned pelting again, and instead of the morning salute, put a shell right into our funnel, costing the lives of four men of the machine gun company. Early at dawn my company's platoon commander, Weisfeld Fiebel Kumpart, with several men joined our detachment. I had scarcely pushed the chill of the night out of my members when I received orders, together with the remnants of the 76th, to attack the Vrocourt position, already partially occupied by us, farther to the right flank. In the thick morning fog we pulled into our original position, a height south of Ekust, strewn with the dead of the day before. As it often happens because of unclearly understood orders, the endless bickering of commanders began, immediately interrupted by a burst of enemy machine gun fire. All jumped into a neighbouring crater, except Fieldfell Kumpart, who fell to the ground with a groan. I hastened to him with a corpsman to bandage him. A shell had struck him in the knee, severely wounding him. We removed a lot of small bones from the wound with forceps. He passed away a few days later. I was particularly mortified because three years earlier, at recuperance, Kumpart had taught me formation training. At a meeting with Captain von Lederber, who had taken command of our assembled formations, I argued the pointlessness of a frontal attack as the position of Rocourt, which we had already partially taken possession of, could be attacked from the left with much less loss. We decided not to carry out the operation, and subsequent events showed that we were right. Temporarily we encamped in the funnels on the heights. The sun cut through the morning haze, and immediately British airplanes appeared and began pouring machine gun fire into our dens, but we soon dispersed them. A battery rode out of the accused area, a sight unusual to old trench warriors. After a while it was shot up. A solitary horse that had broken loose galloped across the field. The frenzied animal on the endless, desolate plain, enveloped by the shifting clouds of shells, made an ominous impression. The enemy pilots had not yet concealed themselves when the first volleys struck us. First shrapnel burst, then countless light and heavy shells began to burst. 
we lay as if on a platter. Cowardly natures were also attracted by the fire, running mindlessly to and fro, instead of huddled in their funnels, giving themselves up to providence. One must be fatalistic in such situations. Such a thought I approved, emptying the glorious contents of a trophy jar of blackcurrant jam. In addition, pulled on some Scottish wool stockings I had found in the dugout. For such activities I was caught at noon. For a long time there had been some movement on the left of the Vrocourt position. Directly in front of us we saw the arcing flight and white explosion of a German hand grenade. This was the moment we had been waiting for. I ordered the advance. More precisely raising my right arm, I simply moved into position. Avoiding heavy fire, we reached the enemy trench and jumped into it, cheerfully greeted by the 76th Regiment Assault Squad. The gradually unfolding grenade attack, as at Cambrai, was slow. It was not long a mystery to the enemy's artillery that we were persistently driving into its lines. The heavy shrapnel fire and light shells caught us just in front, but the reinforcements that followed us and streamed toward the trench were more heavily hit. It was noticeable that the gunners were pelting us with shells, keeping direct observation. We tried to get rid of the enemy as soon as possible in order to stop firing. The Vrocourt position was apparently still under construction, for some parts of the trenches were still marked only by the sod cut from them. When we crossed such sections, all the fire in the neighbourhood was concentrated on us, and we, in turn, were aiming in the same way at the enemy rushing before us on the roads of death, so that soon these small, targeted areas were covered with corpses. A wild hunt was going on, accompanied by clouds of shrapnel. We ran past or climbed over still warm, stubby bodies with strong knees gleaming from beneath their short uniforms. They were Scottish Highlanders and as their resistance showed, they were not cowardly. After running a hundred metres, we were stopped by the increasing fire of rocket-propelled grenades. The men began to retreat. No. Tommy's on the attack. Stop. I just need to find my men. Where are the grenades? Grenades, grenades, grenades. Hmm. Careful, Herr Lieutenant. It is in trench warfare where the most desperate battles are fought, that such failures are most common. The bravest, firing and throwing grenades, rush forward, taking everyone with them. The masses follow them on their heels like an unwilling herd. When encountering the enemy, the fighters begin to rush to escape being shot, and in doing so they run into those who are pressing from behind. Only those in front keep the situation in sight. At the back, among the crowd squeezed by the trench, a wild panic begins. Someone else tries to jump over the cover and immediately, to the unspeakable joy of the enemy, gets a bullet. If he does not yawn, consider that all is lost. Now it is up to the commander he must prove that not for nothing he wears epaulettes, although he will not pass by the familiar warrior sour feeling of fear. I succeeded in gathering a handful of men, and behind a broad crossbar I made a nest of resistance with them. At a distance of a few metres we exchanged shots with the unseen enemy. It took courage to keep my head up in the face of the rumbling bursts that whipped upward sand from the crossbar. Near me, a soldier from the 76th with a wild expression on his face, forgetting caution, fired one round after another until he fell, bleeding. A shell, the explosion of which sounded like the cracking of a splintered board, bore into his f He lay there in his corner, crouched and with his head against the wall. Blood gushed out of him like a bucket, spreading over the bottom of the trench. His wheezing became less and less audible until it stopped altogether. I grabbed his rifle and kept firing. Finally there was a pause. The two soldiers still in front of us tried to leap over the cover. One, shot in the head, fell into the trench. The other, wounded in the stomach, was with difficulty still able to crawl to it. After waiting it out, we sat down at the bottom of the trench and smoked English cigarettes. From time to time bullets flew over us, fired as aptly as an arrow. The wounded man with a bullet in his stomach, just a boy, lay between us and stretched blissfully, like a cat in the warm rays of the setting sun. Smiling childishly, he fell asleep right into death. The sight carried nothing sad or unpleasant, but only a bright feeling of sympathy for the dying man. The moans of his comrade, too, gradually became hushed. After several attacks of fever, he passed away in our arms several times, hunched over and crawling over the corpses of the mountaineers. We tried to advance on the shelled places, but every time the machine gun fire and bullets were thrown back, every shell that flew in front of my eyes was fatal. Thus, the front of the trench was filled with corpses. 
Reinforcements were continually coming from the rear to take their place. Soon there was a hand or machine gun behind each crossbar. I too stood behind one of these machine guns and fired until my index finger was blackened with smoke. Among others, I treated lead to a Scotsman who sent me a touching letter from Glasgow after the war, in which he accurately described the place where he had been wounded. When the antifreeze had evaporated, the tins were let down through the rows, and with coarse jokes they were filled up again in a simple and natural way. The sun stood low on the horizon. The second day of the battle was drawing to a close. For the first time I scrutinised the terrain and sent a drawing and report to the rear, again overwhelmed by the thought, Lord, you are not only a warrior, you are also a soldier trench at a distance of 500 metres, cut the highway Rocoeur. Mori camouflaged by cloth barriers attached to trees. From behind, enemy units were running down the slope, densely showered with bullets. A blue, cloudless evening sky cut through the squadron with a black-white-red pennant. The last rays of the setting sun coloured it in soft pink tones, likening it to a flock of flamingos. We unfolded the maps and laid them white side up to show how deeply we had penetrated the enemy's position. The cool evening wind heralded a frosty night. Wrapped in a warm English overcoat, I leaned against the wall of the trench and chatted with little Schultz, the companion of my Indian patrol who, having captured four heavy machine guns, would, according to the ancient comradeship custom, appear wherever the smell of gunpowder was strongest. At the posts, men from all companies with youthful, sharply defined faces peering out from under their helmets watched the enemy's positions. From the gloom of the trench, I could see their motionless figures frozen as on watchtowers. They were left without commanders. At their own prompting, they stood in the right place. It was at such forward posts, and even in moments of rest after a bloody day, that the warlike spirit of the great race was felt in all its purity, and in no place on earth could the feeling of confidence be deeper than here. We had already prepared for the night's defence. I had my pistol and a dozen lemons by my side, and was ready to meet any alien, even if it was a hard-headed Scotchman. On the right again came the rattle of hand grenades and German flares from the left flank. From somewhere the wind brought a low, multi-voiced hurrah. That warmed us up. They are surrounded, surrounded. In one of those moments of elation that precede great deeds, everyone grabbed their rifles and rushed forward along the trench. After a short grenade fight, the group of Highlanders rushed toward the highway. No one could be held back. Despite the warning shouts, be careful, the left machine gun is still firing. We jumped out of the trench and immediately reached the highway, swarming with confused mountaineers. Long, dense barbed wire was blocking their retreat, so that under the tumultuous shouts of hurrah, which, like the voice of the last judgment, were buzzing in their ears, and pressed by the frantic rapid fire from a distance of fifty metres, they ran away from us as lantwise as hunted game. Instantly, the machine guns turned the slaughter into direct destruction. The crowd on the highway was unimaginable. Victims fell like underfoot to the wild shouts of cheering, the crackle of rifle fire, and the thud of hand grenades. Our superiority was increasing every moment, for dense reinforcements were pouring in with a broad wedge into our shock troops, who were scattered over a wide area by the attack. Reaching the highway, I looked up at it from our side, standing on a steep embankment. The Scottish position stretched along a deepened ditch along the opposite side of the highway, and was thus located below us. But in those first few seconds, it was not in our sight. The huge target of the Highlanders rushing along the wire obliterated all other details. We lay down on the crest of the embankment and opened fire. It was one of those rare moments when you drive the enemy into a crevice while you are burning with the desire to multiply endlessly. As I cursed the fumbling with the charge that was preventing me from firing, I suddenly felt a vigorous pat on my shoulder. Turning around, I saw the angry face of little Schultz, still shooting you damned pigs. I followed his gesture and only then, in the little trench labyrinth separated from us by the line of the highway, did I notice a group of feverishly firing figures, some of them were loading, others with rifles to their cheeks, taking aim. On the right, the first hand grenades had already flown, sending the torso of one of them high into the air. Prudence told me to stay where I was and calmly knock the enemy out with a few shots. Instead, I dropped my rifle and with clenched fists rushed onto the highway between the two parties. To my misfortune, I was still in my English overcoat and red-trimmed cap, to find myself in the enemy's camp in the attire of the enemy. In the midst of the triumphant jubilation, I felt a sharp blow in the left side of my breast. 
Night had fallen all around me. The I was sure I was wounded in the heart, but in the expectation of death I felt neither pain nor fear. To my astonishment I rose at once, and finding not even a hole in my uniform, I rushed at the enemy again. A soldier of my company ran up to me. Here, Lieutenant, take off your overcoat, and tore off this dangerous garment from me. A new hurrah tore the air. On the right, where hand grenades were already in full force, a group of Germans, led by a young officer in brown corduroy, ran to my aid from the other side of the highway. It was Kias. Lucky for me, he jumped over the wire barrier just as the English machine gun gave its last burst, and a sheaf of fire splashed through him, so hard that the shell shattered the wallet that lay in his pocket. The Scotsmen were annihilated in a few furious moments by gunfire and hand grenades. The space around the highway was covered with corpses, and merciless fire flew in pursuit of the survivors. In the seconds that I was unconscious, fate had caught up with little Schultz. As I learned later, in a rage that infected me as well, he jumped into the trench, continuing his rampage. When the Scotsman, who had already unbuckled his belt, saw the state in which he had rushed at him, he picked up a rifle thrown by someone from the ground and put Schultz down with a fatal shot. I stood conversing with Caius in a conquered and grenade-filled section of the trench. We were discussing how to take possession of the guns that were to be nearby. Are you wounded? You're bleeding from under your uniform? Indeed, I felt a surprising lightness and something wet on my chest. We tore off the uniform and found that the shell had passed through the chest just under the iron cross's lunt from the heart. You could clearly see the entrance hole on the right side and the exit hole on the left side. As I was running across the highway at an acute angle from left to right, my own took me for an Englishman and shot me from a few paces away. I was very angry with the man who had torn off my overcoat, but he had meant well, if I may say so, and the real fault lay with myself. Caius put a bandage on me and with difficulty persuaded me to leave the field. We parted, saying to each other only, See you in Hanover. I chose a companion. Found on the highway, still under heavy fire, my tablet, which my unknown soldier had torn from me together with my English overcoat, and in which my diary was kept, and through the trench, where the battle had not ceased, went to the rear. Our battle clamours were so powerful that the enemy's artillery deployed its blows. All along the space behind the highway and over the trench itself lay a barrage of rare density. As I had quite enough of my wound, by short runs from crossbar to crossbar I began to advance to the rear. Suddenly there was a deafening rumble near me at the edge of the trench. I received a blow to the back of my head, and, having lost consciousness, fell to the ground. When I woke up I found that I was hanging head down, thrown over the skids of the machine gun and staring fixedly into the frighteningly fast-growing red puddle at the bottom of the trench. The blood from the wound was whipping so unrestrainedly to the ground that I had lost all hope. However, my companion assured me that the brain was not yet visible, so I got up and went on. Thus, I got even for my thoughtlessness in going into battle without a helmet. In spite of the double loss of blood, I was highly excited, and as if obsessed with an obsession, conjured up every man I came across on the road to run to the front line to take part in the battle. Soon we were out of range of the light field guns and slowed our run, for the few heavy fragments that were still falling could only hit some poor fellow. At Nori Gorge I went to the brigade fighting post, reported myself to Major General Hebel, told him of our success, and asked him to send reinforcements to help the stormers. The general informed me that I had been listed as dead at my battle stations since yesterday. It's happened many times in this war. Probably someone saw me fall near the shrapnel that wounded Hake during the assault on the first trench. In Norie, boxes of hand grenades stacked high were blazing by the roadside. In confusion we ran past. Outside the village, a fur took me in his empty ammunition car. I had a major altercation with the wagon commander, who wanted to throw out of the car the two wounded Englishmen who had supported me the last part of the journey. There was extraordinary excitement on the Norrie Kyant Highway. Who has not seen it, cannot get an idea of the endless stretching one after another wagons, the breadwinners of the great offensive. Beyond Kent, the bustle increased to fantastic proportions. As I passed the little house of little Joan of Arc, it was distressing to see that not even a foundation remained of it. I approached one of the military messenger officers, who was recognisable by his white armbands. He put me in a passenger car going to the Soshikoshi Field Infirmary. 
We often had to wait for half an hour at a time as the road was blocked by cars and vehicles stacked on top of each other. Although the doctors in the operating room were literally feverish, the surgeon had time to marvel at the successful form of my wounds. The bullet that hit my head also went through and through so that the skull remained intact. Much more painful than the wounds themselves, which I felt only as muffled blows, was their treatment, which was undertaken by the orderly after the doctor had probed the two shot canals with playful elegance. The treatment consisted of my head being thoroughly shaved around the wound, without soap and with a blunt knife, having slept well during the night. The next morning I was sent to the assembly medical station at Canton, where to my joy I met Lieutenant Sprenger, who I had not seen since the beginning of the assault. He had been wounded by an artillery shell in the left thigh. Here I found my belongings too, another proof of my loyalty to Finke. After he lost sight of me, he was wounded on a railroad embankment, but before he went to the infirmary and thence to his Westphalian estate, he would not rest until he knew that the things were in my hands. And that was his whole nature. He was rather not a trooper, but my old comrade. How many times, when the allowance became meagre, I found on my table a piece of butter from a man of the company who wishes to remain anonymous, but it was easy to guess him. He had no adventurous streak, like Haller, for example, but he followed me into battle like one of the ancient vassals, and regarded his service as a concern for my person. Many years later, after the war, he asked me for a photograph to tell his grandchildren about his lieutenant. I am grateful to him for the opportunity to look at the dormant strength that the nation supplies to the war in the image of the Landwehr soldier. After a brief stay in the Montigny Infirmary in Bavaria, I was loaded onto an ambulance train at Dieu and travelled to Berlin. There my sixth double wound in two weeks healed as well as all the previous ones. The only unpleasant thing was the continuous and sharp ringing in my ears. Over the course of several weeks it became more and more muffled and finally subsided completely. Only in Hanover did I learn that, as I have already written above, little Schultz had been killed in the melee among other acquaintances. Kiers got off with a harmless wound in the stomach, unfortunately. The cassette containing a number of pictures of the assault on the railroad embankment was broken. Whoever watched our friendly banquet in a small cafe in Hanover, which was attended by my brother with his bruised arm and Batchman with his bruised knee, could hardly think that we had parted from each other two weeks ago to music other than the cheerful popping of corks.